It's really easy to see that that life that you want will still be possible if you start at 30. Your 20s are about being able to feel lost and be comfortable with that feeling and try out a couple of different things. It's all right to feel lost. Hello and welcome back to Deep Dive, the weekly podcast where every week it's my immense privilege to sit down with authors, academics, entrepreneurs and creators and other inspiring people. And we talk about how they got to where they are and the strategies and tools we can learn from them to help build a life that we love. Today, I'm joined by Gemma Speck. Gemma is the podcast host of The Psychology of Your 20s, the podcast that talks through some of the big life challenges and changes of your 20s and what they mean for our psychology. The thing that also links to this quarter life crisis is this, is this idea that the decisions that we make now are going to be the sole reason for our happiness in the future. And that is not the case because your life is going to go a million different directions in a blink of an eye. Now, when I let our podcast community know that Gemma was coming on the pod and asked them to send in the challenges they're facing during their 20s, the thing that really stood out is this feeling that as we transition into adulthood, it can feel like you're on a bit of a hamster wheel of trying to balance all these different aspects of your life. One of my good friends said this to me the other day. I have no idea where I'm going to be in like five years time or 10 years or when I'm 50. And if I continue to work in my nine to five, I would know. I would know that, you know, you move up between, you move up the ranks, your pay increases, you have a family, all those things, right? And what she said to me, and it really stuck with me was, Gemma, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing so well. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm very excited to chat with you today. Okay, so... You are the expert on the psychology of your 20s. Um, and one thing that often comes up when people talk about that is this idea of a quarter life crisis. So oh, yeah. what is a quarter life crisis? And yeah, how do we how do we think about that term? Yeah. So the term quarter life crisis, I think we need to think about it in the context of a midlife crisis, right? That was the first idea that kind of came before the quarter life crisis. And we think about it a lot in terms of a lot of men meet, you know, they, they reach middle age and they go and buy like a red convertible. They get like a young girlfriend. That's a very outdated idea. We're seeing that earlier and earlier people are having these kinds of crises or forks in the road where they have to make these massive decisions or they feel like they do. And what that creates is a sense of anxiety, a sense of dread, a sense of stress. And then sometimes a sense of needing to be spontaneous and to take a risk. So essentially the quarter life crisis occurs between the ages of around 20 to 30. And it involves someone experiencing this sense of what am I doing with my life and where to next? So that's essentially the idea that we're talking about today. And this seems to be a relatively modern phenomenon. Like what do you think is is driving it so prevalent? Like I guess in the last sort of five to 10 years, I've been hearing about this, but I guess I feel like in the early 2000s, it, it probably wasn't really a thing. Yeah, that's actually such an interesting question because I've been thinking about this a lot as well. And I think if we take it back even further to like the 1950s, the 1960s, there was this very almost narrow blueprint of what our lives would look like. We went to high school, we graduated, went to university, picked up our life partner, got a great job, nine to five, bought a house, had children, retirement death. And that's really depressing, right? But it was very narrow. And I think as we entered into the early 2000s, a few things happened. And the first was, of course, the accessibility of the internet and social media. And suddenly, not only did all these new career pathways become available, a lot more opportunities for entrepreneurship, but then we also had this element of being able to look at what everyone else was doing with their lives and compare to that. So we see people now who are traveling the world, people like you and I, who are doing this for a living. It's very unconventional, I would say. Or we see people who are working the, the traditional nine to fives. We have this very amazing spectrum of things that we can compare ourselves to. And I think that kind of flips this switch where we're like, oh my goodness, what am I doing? And then to further that, we're also seeing things like a lot of environmental factors, right? Like, or external factors, like we have a recession coming up. We're not going to deny that. There's all this uncertainty around the climate, around our f financial situation, around financial security. And what that creates is a lot of anxiety around, okay, I need to be future prepared, but then I also want to have fun because this is my twenties and everyone tells me this narrative of you should take risks, you should make mistakes. So that's kind of this friction point where it's, I almost imagine it 
kind of like a tree and all throughout like our teens and, and our young years, it's going the same direction. And then suddenly we're like, oh, there's actually, I'm in charge now. I, this, I get to make these decisions. There are all these people that I can compare myself to and there's all these new careers and all these new options, but then also this, these like these little thoughts in my brain and these external factors that are challenging that. And it's kind of like the tree just goes like, poof. Mm. And we can't really see where everything's going and where that will take us. Sorry, yeah. that was a, a bit of a ramble, but I hope that makes it clear. Absolutely, yeah. So um, w- one thing I've heard from a lot of people is, and I think when we polled our um, podcast community about this, one thing that really came up was people feeling lost. Yeah, yeah. And maybe I should have said that earlier, but that's essentially, I think, all of those feelings wrapped up in one title and one word would be the feel of would being lost, would be the feeling of being lost, right? And... I think that all comes down to this expectation that you need to be on the right path right now. You need to have everything figured out right now. And that is not the case. And I think in our 20s, we are bombarded by all of these life choices that we need to make. We were talking about some before, right? Should I move to a new country? Should I go and do my doctorate degree? Should I just quit my job and go traveling? And all of those things paralyze us because we're overcome by this thing called the paradox of choice. And I also think this is something that's come up a lot more in in the last like 20, 30 years. We're presented with so many options, which is a good thing that it paralyzes us and we can't even make one. And there was this really interesting experiment they did on this, a little bit of a tangent, but these uh, psychologists from Stanford, they went to the farmer's market. And they set up a stall for jam. And on day one, they had 27 jams for sale. And on day two, they only had five. And we think, and they wanted to see how many, how many times people purchased the jam. And on the second day, when people only had five options, their sales were like up 300%. And it shows us that we actually don't want as many choices as we think that we do. And when we do have more choices, we're less likely to act on those and we feel lost because we're unsure of whether we're going to make the right decision. So that's another kind of psychological element behind this experience. I guess part of this this feeling of feeling lost or directionless is this idea of needing to have sorted out like your ideal life. Yeah. Like I've I've heard a lot of people say that like oh I don't know what to do with my life. And, and and the implication there is that that is a really bad thing. Yeah. Um. And sometimes even like when I talk to my mum, she will say that she'll look at my career and say that like I don't have any direction in my career or something like that. That's so funny. <laughs> and I kind of be like, that is true, but it's also not necessarily a bad thing. But at the same time, the phrase "you have no direction in your career" is definitely a negative, rather than mm-hmm. "oh, you don't have any direction in career." Well done, you. Yeah. Yeah. How do you how yeah, what's what do you what are your thoughts on that? I really I really like this this train of thought here because mm. I think about this a lot. I, I think that a lack of direction is comes off very negative, but it also means an abundance of opportunity. And that's something that we need to realize. And one of my good friends said this to me the other day because I recently started doing my own show full time. It was a massive risk for me. I took a massive like step away from the financial security that my nine to five offered me. I did something a little bit against the grain. And the thing that really like struck me was because this path is unconventional, I have no idea. Like podcasting hasn't really existed for that long, right? I have no idea where I'm going to be in like five years time or 10 years or when I'm 50. And if I continue to work at my nine to five, I would know. I would know that, you know, you move up between, you move up the ranks, your pay increases, you have a family, all those things, right? And what she said to me, and it really stuck with me, was stop trying to imagine what your life looks like down to the detail and just imagine how you want your life to feel like on an average Monday afternoon. And I was like, wow, that is so Mm. profound. She was like, picture yourself at 50 and what are you doing on a Monday night? And what does that entail? Because you're not going to be thinking about all the, all the milestones that you hit. You're not going to be thinking about all the successful things that you've done. You're not going to be putting the pressure on yourself to meet all these certain, you know, goals. Instead, when you think about it that way, you just think about what kind of life do I want to be living? What emotions do I want to be feeling? And you acknowledge that there will be multiple paths to get there. And I think that that's very liberating, right? So Mm. I said to her, like, I would want to be living in, 
a big city and I'd want to be having people over for dinner that I'd met, you know, in various places. Maybe I'd have a few people living with me who had picked up along the way, friends, family, random acquaintances. And I want to be able to come back and talk to my friends or talk to my partner about an amazing day that I had. And I want to feel loved and I want to feel happy. And it doesn't matter what happened before that, as long as I'm in that spot. And I think that is a much better frame of mind to be in rather than to look at your life as a series of milestones that you need to hit or as a series of decisions that you need to make and a correct way of going about your 20s and then also your broader life. Does that make sense? Oh, my God. That's such a good way of thinking about it. Like, Can you, What's yours? Can you picture what you want when you're 50? Monday night at 50. Yeah. I think mine is broadly similar um, in that the feelings that I would want is a feeling that I've spent the day you know, still working because uh, mm. I, I enjoyed I enjoy working, but feeling like the work was interesting. I had autonomy and independence. I could kind of do what I wanted. Maybe I learned something interesting. Yeah. Maybe I shared something interesting because for me, teaching and sharing is like a big part of what brings me fulfillment. And then, yeah, go home or stay home uh, in the evening, have friends over for dinner, um, living in a place where it's very easy for friends to hang out and maybe have a family yeah. and kids and all that kind of stuff. That's the sort of feeling that I would want. If I imagine people I know at 50 who have, who are like working in medicine, for example, and the feelings that that seems to invoke in them around like the day job, mm. that feels like the opposite to what I would, I would want. Exactly. But if I imagine people who are authors, like I know a couple of authors in their 50s who can just sort of spend the day going for a walk on the Yorkshire, in the Yorkshire Dales and then writing about whatever takes their fancy because, you know, they've got an advance on their latest book deal or because they've mm. made enough money through royalties to fund their life. And that seems like a good place to be. I love that. And I, I don't know what the Yorkshire is, but it sounds <laughs> lovely. But the but you know what's really interesting is when you picture that, could you tell me like how much money you were making? No one ever thinks like in that in that thought exercise, we never sit there and think, oh, and my salary will, will be this and I'll be driving this car. And um, by the way, like I'm going to have all this money in savings and this is the kind of clothes I'm going to wear. And none of us think back to when you ask yourself that question, it's, you don't think like, okay, well, what, what were the things that, that got me there or what were the mistakes that I needed to make? Or, And it's, it's really easy to see that that life that you want will still be possible if you start at 30. So your 20s are about being able to feel lost and be comfortable with that feeling hmm. and try out a couple of different things. You're, it's, all, it's all right to feel lost. Feeling lost also means having a lot of open doors, um, linking back to that paradox of choice that yeah. we were talking about, right? Yeah, th this reminds me, um, have you come across Tim Urban's blog post? on no. wait, uh, uh, his, He's got an amazing blog, uh, Wait But Why? Uh, and there's a blog post in that, that it's titled something like, Life is a picture, but you live in a pixel. Whoa. And the way he describes it is That's like, so you know, you imagine like Mark Zuckerberg and you think about the picture of his life, like, mm. oh, he must be really happy. He's like rich and he's like powerful and stuff. And yeah. you think of it in those broad brushstrokes. But if, but like Mark Zuckerberg and everyone else is living in a single pixel, they yeah. wake up, they like have breakfast, they like go to the gym, do some work, come home, hang out with the kids, maybe see some friends. Like that is the day to day. Yeah. And it's very easy for us to imagine that happiness is found in the, in the, in the whole picture in like, mm. Like, oh, I'll be this successful and I'll be doing this kind of job. But actually every single day, day to day, we're going to be living in the pixels. And yeah. so we shouldn't over-index on what the broader picture looks like, but actually try and think about what, you know, he says exactly this thing. What are the feelings we want to have in the pixel? Yeah, I love that. And it's so interesting because when we think about the pixel as well, I think it also links to this broader idea of almost the pressure to be successful as well and thinking that that's going to make us happy. Mm. And I think it's really worthwhile to have big goals and like having something that you're good at is amazing. But when you think about people like Mark Zuckerberg or whoever you want to have in mind, um, they're not going through life thinking every second of their waking life, I'm so successful. I'm so successful. My life is perfect. Mark Zuckerberg, like you talk about that day and all I could think about was like, oh yeah, and then he probably got a parking fine or he burned his eggs in the morning or yeah. the person who makes them for him did. <laughs> or like, or, you know, his kids were really was screaming and he had an argument with his wife. Like, I think that the thing that also links to this quarter life crisis is, the, is this idea that the decisions that we make now are going to be the sole 
reason for our happiness in the future and the sole determinant of our happiness, like the sole determinant of our happiness in the future. And that is not the case because your life is going to go a million different directions in a blink of an eye. So many things are going to happen. And I think it's this huge myth that I don't know where it came from, that that we need to know what we're doing in our 20s and the life we create in this decade is somehow going to contribute to, you know, our overall happiness in, in the rest of our lives. Like I I think that you're allowed to treat your life as if it's a discrete moment. Every moment is a discrete moment. Every decade is a discrete decade. The decisions you make in your 20s, yes, some of them will bleed on. If you decide to go to medical school, you're in debt. You've, that's a lot of hours spent, right? But also you can change at any point. You can change your life. You can change what you want to be doing and what the meaning of happiness kind of means for you as well. Mm. So just on that note, it's sounds like we, 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 we talked earlier about the, there's almost these two different narratives that we have about our 20s. One narrative is it's, it's your 20s. It's for exploration. Like, you know, it's all good. And yeah. the other narrative is actually your 20s is for building up some kind of structure and for getting ahead in your career and for mm. starting to grow your income because... By the time you're in your 30s and you settle down and start having kids, you'll be really glad that you actually grinded in your 20s, which unlocks more freedom and more autonomy and more like ability to yeah. spend time with your kids. Whereas if you screwed around in your 20s, now you're 30 and working in an entry level job and getting mm. home at 8 p.m. and unable to spend time with your kids because you haven't got enough money kind of stuff. Yeah. And both of those seem fairly compelling to me. Like I know it's hard, yeah. right? How do, you, how do you think about this? So I think that you can have both. And I know it's really hard to say that, but... You know, I, I had a nine to five job up until very recently. And I, I think that we have this very, because I, I get both, right? Because I get the idea of being like, I want to ensure my future is one that is secure and all of those things. But then I also want to have fun. And it's such a self-limiting belief to think that it's an either, it's, a, it's, it's kind of black and white, right? Mm -hmm. Like either you choose this path or you choose the other there are so many moments in the day that are yours to create and yours to make good and for you to create memories in those. And you can pursue financial security. You can pursue the beginnings of a very fruitful career while still allowing yourself time to take risks, still allowing yourself time to go and explore and to travel. And I think it's all about this balance and also consistency. So I'm going to give a personal anecdote here because I really can only speak to my experience, but I finished uni. I went straight into consulting, which I feel like a lot of people do, right? Consulting was this very broad stroke career idea. It was very structured. I was like, I can do this. And for a while there, I was like, all right, this is the path that we've chosen. I'm going to start saving money. I want a house by the time I'm 27 so that I can set up for my future. And I did that for a while, but at the same time I was doing my podcast, right? On the side. And I was using some of those extra hours that we get in a day to feed into my creativity and to take a bit of a risk and do something that I enjoyed. And slowly but surely that actually begun to overtake the nine to five. So it's about achieving balance by allowing yourself time to pursue the other things. If you've decided that your nine to five or your career is your main focus. Um, where does, where does your life fit in with that? And when I say life, I mean like the important things about life. I mean, where do your friends sit in? Where do your memories sit in? Where does your family sit in? Where does love sit in? Where does all those beautiful, joyful things fit into that equation? Or if you're someone who is like, I'm going to go and travel, I'm going to go and experience the world. I think it's, you got to understand that at some point, there will be some responsibilities that are going to come up that might jeopardize that. Mm. You don't need to think about them now, but just have like a vague idea of what that is and maybe do some things in that time around your traveling to set up for the future. Like go and get a diploma or get some, make a tangible investment in your future self. So maybe that's setting up um, some kind of, I don't know, I don't do investing. So I'm not going to give financial advice, but maybe like set up a portfolio or something like that um, or invest in your education or invest in some kind of unique skill that you can bring to the table that when you decide maybe it's time to settle down, you have that to fall back on, right? I think it's this balance. You don't have to, you don't have to choose one or the other and that's it for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. 
How does that sit with you? Because I know that you you were a doctor, right? Yeah. And then you decided to do something else. Yeah. Yeah, I think I broadly vibe with the idea of balance and mm. I I've I've always regret I've always rejected the kind of black or white thinking. Yeah. Like even at me- at medical school like when I started diving into productivity and the psychology of like achievement and motivation and success and stuff, mm. I would come across things that were like um lionizing discipline and hard work and work ethic and there's yeah. a quote from muhammad ali where he says something like um you know i hated every minute of training but i said don't quit suffer now and live the rest of your life as a champion yeah and i thought like that that doesn't seem like a particularly fun way to spend my university years like no. suffering <laughs> for the sake of i don't know a, a, a fancier number on the certificate at the end of it like still yeah. gonna be a doctor at the end of it right and so the way i approached university and i guess continue to approach life is by thinking how can I work towards the things that I care about with like growth? And, you know, after reading the four hour work week, financial independence mm-hmm. became very important to me. How can I work towards those things that I think I value? But how can I also enjoy every step of the journey along the way? Yeah. Because I have, you know, every, everyone I've ever spoken to who has achieved anything major has said that the achievement itself is hollow. Oh, and it's yeah. really just the journey that, you know, as Marley Sara says, it's the climb. It's just it's all about the, the climb. climb. <laughs> and if the climb is fun, then... It all, like the the destination is almost doesn't matter. It, it it matters only insofar as it gives you something. It gives you a direction to head in. Yeah. And as you hit milestones along the way, great. Now your identity changes. If you start making, you know, three k a month, then you become the sort of person that could push for five, push for ten, push for yeah, fifty, a hundred, like whatever those numbers might be. As you work more and more towards them, your skills and your identity identity changes. So I'm just all about trying to enjoy the journey as much as possible while yeah. also working towards some sort of destination. I love that. And I think that's a really healthy way of thinking about things, right? And I always say this on my show, but life is going to go forward. Life is going to move on regardless of the decision that you make. Hmm. But what's going to matter is whether you're happy with that decision or you're miserable because those hours are still going to occur. Those days are still going to happen. But when you imagine yourself in those days, when you imagine yourself in those years, are you going to be happy? Are you actually going to be satisfied with your life? And if the answer is no, regardless of what decisions you're making, then you probably should rethink it. And I think that that's very much ties in with this idea of the journey might sometimes be hard, right? But you also need to realize and kind of adopt a bit of an existential outlook on life, which is that, you know, people have different religious beliefs, but from my perspective, you really do only get one life on this earth. Mm. And when you're gone, that's it. And no one's going to remember you and your impact, whatever that may be, it's probably going to fade away. It will inevitably fade away. What matters is, is the quality of your life. So, and I think that that especially relates to people who are receiving a lot of external pressure from family, from society to only be the amalgamation of their successes and only be like their personality, their identity is only linked to what they've achieved and their actual enjoyment of life is kind of negligent and it's, it doesn't matter. So I think that's something we need to rethink, right? When you talk about that Muhammad Ali quote, like that makes me shiver because I'm like, Maybe I'm just not disciplined, but I would never do something like that if, like, the journey was awful. Mm. But, like, I got, like, a title at the end of it. And even then, like you said, sometimes that's just as hollow because once you've reached that goal, you kind of look around and think, what else do I have to show for this Mm. other than this one success, this one major dopamine hit, this one moment in my life? Yeah, one one question I occasionally ask myself while journaling is that, uh, if I were to die tomorrow, would I be reasonably happy with how I've spent the last month? Mm, interesting. And if the answer to that is, uh, you know, is ever, ever leans towards not really, then I think, ah, okay, I need to change something. Yeah. Because that means that I'm not actually, uh, like, I, th- I, I think that's when if I was suffering every day in training, working for something, then I just mm. died before the thing happened. Or worse, I achieved the thing and then got depressed at the end of it because I realized that it was all, it was all hollow. I feel like that's th- th- that's a question that sort of cuts through that and mm. encourages us to enjoy the journey as well alongside working towards whatever goal we're working towards. Yeah, and I always say like that's actually really interesting and I, I'm going to start using that. I was just thinking to myself, 
whether that whether I am happy with the last month that I've hmm. lived. Are you? I am actually. Nice. I was like, wow, actually I think a couple months ago I would have probably said no and I'm really happy now. But I also think that sometimes there are going to be like crunch periods and periods that yeah. you're gonna to have to work really hard. Just like awful things are going to happen. You know, people pass away, things happen, sickness happens, breakups happen, yeah. suffering happens. But it's about whether the the future that you're imagining for yourself is going to make up for that and going to be worth more than that. And I guess that's also a question to ask yourself. Also, like consistency is key, right? You can avoid some of that massive periods of stress, you know, the avoidable periods of stress, right? Like you, some things just happen and you can't avoid them. But the burnout, the the hours at the library, the, the hours of overtime, sometimes you can avoid that by just being um, consistent and balancing both hard work and the good things in life by building really great habits that slowly accumulate and build into greater productivity, as you, would, as you talk about a lot, and then also um, kind of an advantage in the sense that you've been doing this work and, and not just in these sprints but over the long over the long term. So I also think that's good because then you don't have to feel like every action you take, every moment you live needs to be striving towards this goal. You know that you'll slowly improve and mm. slowly work towards something rather than feeling the burden of doing it all in this moment. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess like, yeah, we've we've kind of talked about um, kind of defining the quarter life crisis and all these emotions and feelings that it's very, very normal to feel these days when people are in their 20s. Mm. Um, I even know some people feeling that in their sort of late teens where they're like, oh, damn, I'm 16 and I really should have figured out my life by now. And oh, it's kind of like, I was yeah. like that. Were you like that as a teenager? <laughs> uh, not really. I didn't think about things too hard. Just... I was like that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, my God. I must have been such a little brat. Like, I must have been so annoying. But I was like, oh, my goodness, if I don't get into this university and if I don't get perfect grades and if I don't get a perfect ATAR, which for people in Australia will know this term, but it's like your final school grade. Mm. Um like my life is going to be terrible. Oh, okay. I was like that as well. I just didn't yeah. admit it to myself. <laughs> there you go, yeah. yeah. And I was like, my life is going to be terrible. And yeah. it's so funny because one of my friends took like a completely different approach and she was like, I don't care. I want to have fun. She didn't get a great final score and she is doing amazing things. She is like the happiest person I know. And I think it just goes to show that like, you can't plan out what your life is going to look like and you don't need to be worried about it. Like, oh my God, if I could go back to 16 year old me, I would just like sit her down and just be like, go to a party and, and do a bit of underage drinking. Like you need to let loose here, like mm. go and run around. Like you need to, you need to chill out just a little bit. You don't need to rush. It's going to be all right. So. All right, we're just gonna take a quick break from this episode to introduce our sponsor, which is very excitingly Huel. Now Huel is great because I've been a customer of Huel for the last six years. And also we've got an interview with Julian Hearn, who is the founder of Huel on this podcast. So you can check that out. It'll be on the YouTube channel and on the Spotify page. And that wasn't a fantastic masterclass in entrepreneurship. But anyway, we're talking about Huel because Huel is a fantastically complete meal. So if you're like me and you have a fairly busy life and you don't necessarily make the time to shop and cook and prep and wash up like a healthy meal at home, which is obviously ideal, then the nice thing about Huel is that it's a great alternative to an unhealthy cereal or an unhealthy takeaway meal, for example. I particularly like the Huel Black Edition because this is high protein and lower carb. So for 400 calories, you get 40 grams of protein. And so this is absolutely fantastic for workout days where I'm trying to get my 160, 180 grams of protein in. And it's also great because the high protein helps me stay full for a lot longer. I take my two scoops of the Black Edition powder. I like the Banana Edition and the Salted Caramel Edition. I'll mix it up in my Nutribullet blender thing with water and maybe a little bit of milk sometimes. And then I'll just sip on that while I'm working at my desk. And that will get me the appropriate level of protein that I need. It'll get me a decent chunk of carbohydrates and fibers and fat, and also 26 different vitamins and minerals, which are generally very good for the body. It's also very reasonably priced. Like if you work it out, it comes out to one pound 68 per meal-ish, which is about 400 calories. And that's way cheaper than an alternative would be if you were ordering takeout, for example. So if that sounds up your street and you would like a nutritionally complete and affordable and healthy option for some of your meals, then head over to heal.com forward slash deep dive. And if you use that, your URL heal.com forward slash deep dive, they will send you a free t-shirt and also a free shaker bottle thing with your first order. I still use my t-shirt. It's great. It's nice elastic key. It fits reasonably well. It makes me look kind of hench. So you can check that out heal.com forward slash deep dive. So thank you so much heal for sponsoring this episode. 
This episode is very kindly brought to you by Trading212. Now, people ask me all the time for advice about investing because I've made a bunch of videos about it on the YouTube channel. And my advice for most people is generally invest in broad stock market index funds, which is exactly what you can do completely for free with Trading212. It's a great app that lets you trade stocks and funds and ETFs and foreign exchange if you really want to. And one of the great things about the app is that if you're new to the world of investing, you can actually invest with fake money. You don't have to put real money in. They've got a practice mode where you invest fake money and then it actually tracks what the market is doing in real time. So you can see, had I invested £100 into this thing, what would my return have been? X weeks or X months further down the line. Once you've got some comfort with that, then it's super easy to deposit money into your Trading212 account. You can use Apple Pay, like I do initially, or you can use a direct bank transfer. And then once the money is in your Trading212 account, then you can invest it in basically whatever you want. The other really cool feature about Trading212 is their pies feature. So what you can do is you can follow people who've created investing pies. For example, someone might have a pie where, I don't know, 30% of it's Apple and 20% is Tesla and 10% is the S&P 500. And you can follow people on the app and see what pies they've created. And you can see the performance of those pies. And then you can just copy and paste a particular pie into your own account. And so that means like, let's say you've got hundred pounds to invest and you've put 50 of it into the S&P 500, but you want to be a little bit more experimental with the other 50 pounds, you can invest it into a pie where someone else who's generally a pro or someone in their bedroom who just loves the markets has already done all the homework for you. Also, very excitingly, there's a new feature that they've added to the app, which is a daily interest on your uninvested cash. These interest rates may go up or down over time as the economic environment changes, but the cool thing is that you get paid out every single day if you're into that sort of thing. And so if you haven't yet started with investing and you want to give it a go, then you can download the app on the App Store and if you use the coupon code ALI, A-L-I at the checkout, that will give you a totally free share worth up to £100. It's available on iPhone and Android and you can check it out by typing in Trading212 into your respective App Store. So thank you so much Trading212 for sponsoring this episode. I guess we're both kind of on the same page that mm. really, you know, this, this question that we're trying to answer is like, how do we navigate our 20s? It's like, it's it's really all about balance. Yeah. Like you don't want to completely screw up your career for the sake of chasing heroin or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but also you don't want to completely screw up your <laughs> your 20s by grinding all the hours at the investment bank and not actually having yeah. the time for anything else in your life. Um, one thing I wanted to, wanted to ask you about is um, habits that, you think kind of based on your research and the people you've talked to, mm. habits that are useful to develop in your 20s. So I guess when we're thinking about how to navigate our 20s, there's a few like broad categories. There is relationships, there is career, there's sort of work-life balance, mm. that kind of stuff. Um, there's, I guess, confidence, finding your true self, like understanding what, what you personally vibe with. And then I guess health is is a fifth. Mm. So I wonder if we can just kind of blitz through these in turn. And I'd love to get your take on, on each of these yeah. five categories. So- Starting with relationships, um, what do you think people struggle with most in their 20s when it comes to relationships? Oh my goodness. Um, I'm going to take relationships to be relatively broad. I think we often think about romantic partners, but I think that our friendships are the most important relationships that we have in our 20s, more so than any other decade. You know, our early early childhood years and our teens, it's family. Most of us meet a partner by in our 30s and 40s, then it becomes the partner then it becomes the kids right but our 20s are like friendships galore but i think the thing that people struggle with is have i found the right people in my life and am i investing in the right people in my life and and part of that is also to do with loneliness right and and feeling lonely and feeling like you don't have the right people around you so i think like a massive habit around that is it links to understanding that you most people are never really truly alone and that being lonely and feeling alone, being alone and feeling lonely are very different things. So the thing that I do is that you need to make plans with your friends or almost create a schedule for yourself to spend quality uninterrupted time with the people that you care about at least two to three times a week and make that a non-negotiable not only is it going to really improve your mental health, but additionally, it's going to kind of circum it's going to kind of circumnavigate or avoid that feeling that we are alone and that we're lonely. Cause I know that's something that people really, really struggle with. So that's like my first relationship habit. Make time for your friends and make it tangible so that you can follow it. So two to three times a week, I want like two hours of your time devoted to something that feeds into your relationship needs. Mm. 
I'm glad you bring this up because when we asked in our podcast community, we, mm. we you know, I said we were, we were interviewing you and we had more responses to that than to anything else we've ever posted in the podcast community because oh, there were so loads funny. of people like, oh my God, like I'm struggling with all these things in my oh. 20s. And one of the main themes that really came up was this feeling of loneliness. Oh, yeah. It's massive. Mm. It's massive. And actually, there was a study that they did recently that showed people between the ages of 16 to 30, I think, um, or maybe it was 25 to 35. Basically, this period right now, in our 20s, is when people experience the greatest, greatest amounts of loneliness. And we typically think that it's around, you know, our, our people who are elderly. And we have this very outdated idea of people sitting alone in their flats. Um, partners have died, for, kids have, have moved away, and they're the lonely ones. But actually, in our 20s, it's such a weird time where we do feel this overwhelming sense of a feeling lost and b feeling really disconnected so I think that kind of links to my second habit that I want to talk about which is feel comfortable being alone and the way that you can build this habit is much like we devote time to our relationships you need to create time in your week to experience solitude so something I do and this is a habit that I've had to build over time is to actually carve out like a day each week or a night each week where I do not talk to anyone, where I enjoy my own company, where I sit with myself in silence or I feel like the, you know, from the urge to like put something on the TV or to like be on your phone, that's not solitude, that's not alone time, you're just distracting yourself. Find time to sit with yourself and be alone with your thoughts and engage in something that is helpful for understanding you. And that might be a hobby. That might be journaling. I'm a big proponent of journaling. And because that's like, that's just you and the page, right? That's just you and the page talking about what you want to talk about and what's going on in your mind. Um, and I think that is really vital for accepting the fact that loneliness is not your enemy and that solitude is actually quite sacred and so much good stuff can come out of forcing yourself to be alone with your own thoughts and your feelings for even just a couple hours a week. Yeah. We did a, an interview last season uh, with uh, Francesca Spector, who is the author of a book called uh, Alonement, oh. which is all about like actually taking alone time a bit more seriously than we do. Oh, I love that. And since doing that, um, I've, I've kind of lost the habit a little bit. But for, for, for several weeks, I would occasionally do like solo dates with myself in a new restaurant. Oh, I love and I that. just I just love going to restaurants and cinemas by myself. It's so nice. Yeah. I just take a little journal with me, you know, I'll just order whatever. It's like journal and feel good. It's just yeah. su such great vibes to do like once a week. And I find it, if it's more often than that, it starts to get a bit much. Yeah. Um, but the... I, f I find that I, I I take that scheduling time with friends thing like super seriously as well, where um, every Tuesday night is like friends dinner. Um, Sunday mornings are brunch with my brother and my housemate um, mm. and, and my brother's wife. And we invite friends over for there. So we have these two default slots in the calendar. And then inevitably, you know, like Monday and Thursday night is date night. And so Wednesdays and Fridays get like often by default filled up with creators who are in London for the week or, or yeah. things like that. And so with the craziness of the calendar, I, 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 I often don't make that time for alone time anymore because mm. it always feels like, oh, actually, you know, this person's in town and of course I should prioritize that. It and selfish then to do it, it, doesn't it? Yeah. And then eventually like it, I just, after a few weeks of this, I'll, I'll get to a point where I, I feel like I've just been nonstop and I haven't really taken the time to reflect on, on how the week's gone or how the month has gone. Mm. So I find these sort of periods of alone quite, quite helpful. Yeah. Self-reflection. It's a habit. You've got to, you've got to build it as well. What sort of questions do you ask yourself when journaling? Um, so I actually have this amazing journal that someone sent me from, oh my gosh, I want to say Scotland. And each week it has these, uh, each day actually it poses a little question. So the journal structure is what are my goals for tomorrow? Um, what's list like 10 things that you're grateful for today? Um, and that's another habit that we're going to talk about in a second. And then it will be like, um, what, what is one song that represents how you're feeling right now? Ooh. Or, um, what is one small thing in your life right now that you could change and you'd be happier for it? Or what is one, one goal that if someone said you could have this right now, you would want, it's like those little things that make you really think about, um, make you really think about where you sit with yourself and your values and, and all of those things. And then if I just like free journal, I'll just write about 
whatever's on my mind, mm-hmm. um, normally how I'm feeling, like if I've had a rough day or, um, you know, I went through a breakup like a year ago and, oh, my goodness, reading back over that was also a lot. But it's all about processing your own emotions and not needing other people to validate or reinforce how you feel because you are the most important relationship that you're ever going to have and the others contribute to that. But if that relationship isn't steady, if you don't know yourself well enough, it everything else is going to be formed on a rocky foundation. Mm, yeah, I love that. One one thing I enjoy doing is collecting journaling prompts. Oh, cool. Because a bunch of people I follow on Twitter like just enjoy journaling as well. And when I see a prompt, I'm like, oh, that's a great question. Oh, yeah. Because I think there's just something to the power of asking yourself and other people powerful questions. Yeah. Because sometimes if I ask myself what's on my mind, I'm just like, eh, I, I, it, it's, it's hard to really answer that properly. But if I ask myself something like, what's one thing, what's one thing I did today that if I, or, or, or if I ask myself that if I repeated everything I did today, would I be closer to where I want to be or further away from where I want to be? Oh my God. And then that reminds me, huh, that's interesting. Wow. I actually haven't, I actually didn't go to the gym today. And so if I repeated every single day, if I, I repeated today for the, for the next year, I'd probably be in pretty bad shape. Cool. I didn't call my mum or, or my grandma today. That's something mm. I should change. And it just like prompts those sorts of things, which otherwise, if I just ask myself what's on my mind or open up a journal, those thoughts wouldn't have come out. Yeah. I really like that. Now, when we're in the school or university, friendship galore, like you live next to people, everything's mm, all good. So fun. But then people graduate, they get jobs, friends move away, everyone gets busy. And it seems like even if you're living in the same city, like I'm now living in London, like literally all of my friends, with mm. the exception of a handful of uh, friends who are doctors who have moved to different parts of the world, um, all my friends are in London. And yet it still feels like I see my school friends once every six months, once a year, because even though we're we're in London, just sort of getting the calendars to line up and schedules to line up and all that kind of stuff. Plus the fact that it usually needs one person to take the initiative. And if everyone's busy, no one does that. Have you got any tips or best practices or habits for um, maintaining or building new friendships post-university? Yes. So I'm going to, I'm going to offer you two here. Perfect. The first one is around those pre-existing relationships. I truly believe that you should be the person to take initiative. If you want something, if you want to see these people, if those relationships are kind of falling apart, like be be the person, be the person who takes initiative. It can take a lot of energy, but I'm that person in 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 my friendship groups and I'll do things like let's one of them is I do a Sunday dinner. Mm. So every Sunday when I'm in town, I say to anyone who lives in Sydney who I know, come for dinner. Just bring a bottle of wine, bring dessert, bring something and have a feed. And just let me know like four hours in advance if you're coming along, bring partners, bring anyone. And that nice. Sunday dinner is actually such like is like the glue for some of my relationships. And not to say that like those people are only coming for the free food, but they're so busy that having a discreet day where I know that we're going to see each other actually is a lot easier for a lot of people to, to navigate with such busy lives. Um so that's actually a, a, a tip. I wouldn't say a habit, but a tip. Um, if you can afford to do it, if you have the time, make the initiative. Something like a Sunday dinner or like a Saturday brunch club is like a great kind of uh, activity to bring people together. And the the other habit that I think is really important is to be consistent in your hobbies and your activities if you're looking to make new friends. So I think this applies to a lot of people in their 20s. I moved to a new city um, like like almost two years ago, a year and a half ago. And I left behind this whole community that I had. And I felt like I was starting from scratch. And the best thing that I did was invest time in consistently going to the same activities and the same hobbies week in, week out. And those were cycling classes and rock climbing. When you go to the same location and do the same thing in the same building, it's likely that the same people are going to be there. And it's likely that you already have something in common that you can bond over. And similarity we know is the biggest, biggest determinant of friendship, similarity and proximity and then reciprocity. So you kind of already have those two down, right? Similarity, you're doing an activity that you know the people in that room already like. And proximity, you're going to see these people week in, week out if they also are showing up consistently at the activities that you're doing. I made so many friends that way because you start to become familiar faces in each other's lives. You strike up a conversation. Next thing you know, are you coming next week? Yeah, I am. We should get a coffee beforehand. Boom. Friendship. Nice. That's a, that's a really big habit that I, 
and a habit, but also a tip that I think is so valuable if you want to make new friends is to show up in the same places at the same time. And I'm sure that the, the people that you actually find yourself really being aligned to will be the people who are doing the same thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's such a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think Thank like, you. I feel like one of the one of the, one of of the things about university and why people often end up making friends with the people that they live next to is just that proximity thing. Mm. And it's less about quality time and more about quantity time. Oh, yeah. And so showing up to the same activity, like I, I started kickboxing lessons a few months ago, but I've really half-assed it and I haven't shown up to the group classes consistently. <laughs> and therefore, there's no chance I'm going to make friends with anyone there. But if I just showed up for like a few weeks in a row, chances are I would have made friends with at least one person there. And like, you know, they go to the pub afterwards and you join them. And then yeah. that's how friendships are formed. Yeah. Whereas, oh, I'm so I'm too busy this week because work. And I'm too busy that week because work. And I'm too busy that week because I've got other plans. Now it makes it a lot harder to make friends in that specific setting. Yeah. Well, the other one that's really good is um, sports games. So like sports games. <laughs> I do. That sounds so naive, <laughs> but matches yeah. but uh sports teams so like i joined my futsal team like a futsal team that oh, was great wait, a what team a futsal it's like indoor soccer F futsal you know? yeah it's indoor soccer oh. in australia oh cool do you guys not have that here i mean we call it indoor football but oh, like indoor, yeah oh, we football. don't have a, a oh, proper yeah. name for it yeah wait that's we don't have football in australia. no you call it soccer so, yeah it's nice. soccer <laughs> indoor soccer <laughs> so that was great and i also think another habit it, it that it's also aligned to this idea of making friends um that i think anyone needs to form whether you are in your teens or your 20s or your 30s that is active listening active listening is such an attractive quality in any friend any partner any workmate any acquaintance so you want to possess that as well and i think that it's a skill that takes time so practicing actually listening to what people are saying acknowledging how their body is reacting to you trying to and it comes naturally over time i think we're actually not inherently great listeners this in this generation because we're so bombarded by all this stimulus and all these things going on in our brain and in our environment that sometimes these kinds of conversations, the one that we're having right now, um, can it can be very hard to engage in them. So practice active listening, practice actually making eye contact with someone, trying to imagine what they're what they're feeling, what they're thinking, and engage with what they're saying to you and reciprocate that. I think that when we talk about relationships in our 20s, whatever that may be, being an active listener makes you um, an attractive person to have a relation, relationship with, someone mm. who's enjoyable to be around and it just causes all of our relationships to, to flourish. Mm. Any tips for active listening? Um, so I, I think that I realised that I wasn't a great active listener and um, someone gave me this tip was to – Really look at, like, okay, I'm going to act, well, you're not talking, but I'm going to pretend that I'm active listening to you right now, is to really, like, look at someone and be, and, and really try and sit in their words and picture their words and imagine what they're saying. So instead of just being like, oh, this is just stuff that's coming into my ear, like, really imagine that you're in their stories with them. And that visualization will, it will make you more engaged, A, but it will make you seem more engaged mm. because you are. Um, the other thing to do, I think, active listening is not just about what's coming out verbally. It's also about someone's body and really taking time to acknowledge, okay, I, we all kind of understand various body cues, actually recognize them and pick up on how is this person feeling and can I make them more comfortable or um, how am I acting right now? And is that making them uncomfortable or is it making them feel safe? So all of the, those two kind of things to, to understand and, and to get further into what someone else is telling you, I think is important. And, and it is just a skill, I think. Mm. Yeah. One, one, uh, one thing I was researching for my book was, you know, what are the differences between energizing relationships and draining relationships? I love this concept. Um, and one of the key things that came up in in the in the studies that I was looking at was um, the idea of uh, energizing responses. Mm. So, for example, if someone shares news, then there's sort of four different ways to respond to that. And yeah. the two main axes for that are, is it active or passive? And is it constructive or destructive? Mm. So active constructive is where we kind of want to be for the most energizing relationships, which is, you know, you, you say you've just run a half marathon or whatever, and an active constructive response might be, oh my God, that's incredible. Tell me more about how did it feel? And it's mm. like, I'm building on it and asking you to share more. That's so good. A, a passive constructive response would be, oh, that's cool. 
yeah passive i mean it's constructive in that i haven't like torn you down for it but yeah it's not that energizing it's sort of neutral at best a passive destructive response would be um kind of oh cool but let me tell you about the thing that i did where it's yeah. like kind of the self-centered thing and then an active destructive response is a total dick where someone's like well that's not such a big deal like blah blah blah, yeah. blah, blah. like why would you think you should do that you're going to ruin your knees that would just be a completely unhelpful response. Yeah. And shifting more towards energizing interactions, active constructive responses to things. There's like genuine evidence from like psychology studies that people who do that are seen as more energizing, more charismatic, more enjoyable to be around than people that respond in any of the other three ways. It's so powerful, isn't it? And it's um, the one that you said uh, it's active, uh, no, passive constructive. Is that it? Where someone's like, oh, that's cool. Yeah. Isn't that the worst? Mm. I honestly think that that's worse than someone being like, oh, cool, but guess what I did? Mm. I, like, and especially when you share news with with um, friends or family and I think those are the people that we love the most and we trust the most and we want them to be like really in our corner. But then you have to remember that the, the reaction that you want from someone else, you need to give them as well. So yeah. Anytime someone gives you really great news, like you need, like you should be genuinely excited for them if they're someone that you care about or someone that you like or someone that you know. I think that's so valuable. Just reciprocating yeah. good energy from the people that you want in your life is so powerful in our ways. Yeah. yeah. The other, the other tip that um, one of our team members actually shared with me uh, was, you know, something he's found really helpful is just greeting someone very effusively. Because mm -hmm. if like we hang out with a friend, like I think especially as dudes, um, I suspect it's like you're kind of trying to play it cool. Like oh, really? you don't want to be too keen and you don't want to come across as like, you know, a bit too kind of emotionally expressive. And so you're just like, oh, hey, man, how's it going? Whereas like if I'm like, oh, my God, Godwin, it's so good to see you. It's been so long. Like, how are you? Yeah. Like just something like that makes the other person feel great, makes you feel great, starts the interaction off on the right foot. Like. And it's a very easy hack, just like greeting people more effusively than you think yeah. you should. Um, really helps to, again, make relationships more energizing. Yeah, and I think sometimes think people think that that's inauthentic, and I don't think that's the case. Um, I think it's just about tapping into how you really feel about someone. Mm. And it's almost like adopting like a Labrador philosophy of like, oh, my God, I'm so excited to see this person. And even if you don't, like, you know, you have those days where you're like, I'm so tired. I'm so tired yep. and I really wanted to cancel these plans, but I haven't seen this person in six months. And a lot of it is about like faking it till you make it. If you like are really, ex if you act really excited to see someone, you will feel excited to see them and they'll feel excited to see you. And then it's like an amazing positive experience. So mm. I really do believe in, in that advice that you just gave. Absolutely. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. Um, Act effusively. How, how do you think about setting boundaries in relationships? Oh, I, I really believe in this. And I do think that it's become a bit of a therapy, like a therapized idea. Obviously it's based in therapy, but there's so much dialogue about this online rhetoric about boundary setting online. I think it's become a bit misconstrued, but our twenties are, are really a, a great time to learn how to set healthy boundaries. And when I say healthy, I mean, respectful for yourself, but also respectful of others. Sometimes we think, okay, I need to set a boundary and that means that I'm just going to fully cut this person off and that's it. That's not healthy. That's not mature. Um, I think a massive habit around setting boundaries is to do with uh, really understanding what you want out of your relationships. I think another part of that is really understanding how our people pleasing tendencies really feed into the relationships we have. So the habit that I think that we need to set, that the thing that we need to get better at in this generation is A, understanding what we want from our relationships and the behavior that we won't accept and B, learning how to uh, communicate that to people without being worried about hurting their feelings. And I don't think that there is one specific way that we can go about this. I think there are many ways that people arrive at this point and often it comes from really horrible experiences. Like, mm. have you had this experience where you haven't set a boundary until it's way too late? Yep. And then you're like, oh my God, I wish that I had done this sooner and I would have avoided, my, avoided so much pain. Mm. And someone said this to me the other day, but the most compassionate people have the best boundaries. And I just think that is so so spot on like what's an example in your life where you've set a boundary and it's been helpful um i think a massive habit 
around that is getting used to being vulnerable and being honest with the people in your life. So I have this example from when I moved to Sydney, that really shook up a lot of my relationships. I went to university in Canberra, which is the capital of Australia, and I left all of my really good friends behind. That put our relationship, long distance friendships, that puts your relationship under a lot of strain. And I had this, I wouldn't say problem. This is one of my closest friends. There's never a problem that can't be solved. There really isn't any problems, but I think this friction and this confusion around how much time I was going to be able to devote to coming back to see this person or coming back to, or or to calling them all the time or always replying to their messages, right? Like I had this new life that I was trying to invest in. I really respected her, but there was this friction occurring where I couldn't maintain both, right? I couldn't come back every weekend. I was trying to create a new life. So what I started trying to do was to build up honesty with her. And it was honesty in the sense of just being honest about what was going on in my life and then slowly building up to being honest about the state of our relationship. Mm. And honesty is itself a boundary, right? Because in honesty, we communicate what we want. So what I ended up doing was the bound when I wanted to set a boundary, I gave her an option. So I would say, for example, it was her birthday actually recently. And I would say, okay, your birthday is is on this weekend. You want me to come down for two nights. Um, I actually can't do that because I'm, I've got a lot going on with work. Which night would you like me to choose? Which night would you like me to come down? Mm. And it's about being honest. Yes. But also setting boundaries and, and being willing to compromise. Um, I think that's the healthiest version of a boundary that you can come to. You've got to remember that boundaries aren't just around making sure everything goes your way. Life is really like relationships in life are really complicated. You're going to have to compromise sometimes. Um, But if you have good boundaries that are respectful and that are you're willing to be somewhat flexible on, I think that makes them a lot more robust. So we've talked a little bit about relationships. Let's talk about careers. Now, Mm. we talked about that whole navigating that like travel the world and find yourself versus grind and hustle in your 20s. And it's kind of said that it's important to get a bit of a, a, a little bit of a balance. But I guess with that, with that in mind, that balance is what we're trying to go for here. Um, what are some habits that you think are helpful to develop in your 20s? Yeah, I think career is a big thing on our minds, right? Um, especially in our 20s, as we talked about throughout all of this. But the first habit I think that you need to kind of cultivate is stepping out of your comfort zone. I think that there is this saying that I love when it comes to this, which is that you can either choose to be comfortable or you can choose to grow. And our 20s are an amazing point where we can we can we can grow and we have the opportunities and we have the freedom to kind of push the limits of what we think is possible. So we don't know most of us wouldn't have kids in our early 20s. Most of us wouldn't have a mortgage, I would assume, wouldn't be married. Um, Those are like three massive responsibilities. And once those come into play, it's a lot harder to take a risk in your career or step out of your comfort zone, big or small. So using that that time and especially in our early 20s to capitalize on that opportunity is so valuable. And what that could look like is going back to university. If there's something that's really captivated your attention, going and getting a diploma. Um, I know that's easier said than done in Australia. It's free. You get a loan from the government. So I'm sure there's people listening out there who don't have that financial opportunity and and don't have the ability to do that. But also um, stepping out of your comfort zone means applying for jobs that like are just a little bit above where you think you currently are, asking for promotions, those kinds of things really, most of the time, if you apply for like, if you apply for a job that's a little bit above where you currently sit, you'll probably get it. And yeah, there'll be a couple of months where you're kind of learning the ropes, but that's going to really put you in good stead for the future, maybe at that company, but also in your career as well. Mm. Yeah, on that note, there was a, a good stat. I think it was from the book Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. Oh, Slay. Love Sheryl yeah, Sandberg. So good. Um, where, where she said something like, um, when women look at a job description, uh, they think they're suited if they match 100% of the requirements. Mm. When men look at a job description, they think they're suited if they match 60% of the requirements. <sighs> And it's just such a big gap in like how seriously people take job descriptions and like job requirements yeah. and stuff, but also how willing or unwilling certain people are to 
put themselves in that position of uncomfortableness mm. or even just like backing themselves that like, yeah, mm. I got this. How hard can it be? Yeah. And I think that women are naturally taught to feel a little bit smaller when it comes to those things. And yeah. um, I think naturally, obviously we've been in the workforce for a while, but yeah. there is still that expectation of like, oh, I don't want to be like, I don't want to be the reason why some, some stereotype is met. Mm. So I want to make sure that I really... I'm really aligned to what is expected of me. That's not all women, but I would say like that example that that, um, that Lean In gave, that book gave, is like super spot on. Mm. Any tips on that front? Like if if there are women listening to this who are yeah. struggling with this career thing and seeing their male colleagues like be more bullish for promotions and stuff like that, and they're like, I'm kind of doing a good job, and like no one's no one's noticing my input. Yeah, um, Lean In, no. <laughs> Um, this is going to maybe come off a bit strange, but be rude. You can be rude. Ask for what you want. Because most of the time when women are rude, it comes off as normal. Um, I think that women's like, when, when we think of, of rude, we think that it's really like, you know, I have so many friends who are like, oh, was that rude? Like, was what I said rude? And I'm like, absolutely not. It's just that I think as, as a gender, we can be quite people pleasing. So as a tip, just ask for it. Be rude. Push back. If someone keeps interrupting you, keep, keep talking until they get the message. Don't let them cut you off. Um, say your piece. I think also put your hand up and if you think that you have something really valuable to share, you should share it. It's not rude. You're not, you're not being aggressive. You're just doing your job and you're just taking up the space that you deserve to take up. And um, I think when it comes to promotions, um, you don't have to be like, oh, all my male colleagues are getting promoted and, and make it about gender if you don't want to. Sometimes that is true. Sometimes it's not. But if you have a reasonable case for being like, I should receive this promotion, that's that's your duty to do that. Like you, you should respect yourself enough to go into your manager's office or the HR office and make your case. It's not rude. You're not being aggressive. You're just self-assured and, and you know your worth. And I think that's something that I think men and women kind of have to learn, especially younger people have to learn mm. um, that no one's taking anything personally here. Yeah. You've just got to do what's best for yourself. Yeah, I guess it's it's very easy to think that, oh, if 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 I do a good job, my manager is just going to notice and of course oh, I'm going to no get the promotion. Way. Like, yeah, how do you <laughs> counter that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think that's true. And I think that um, it, it kind of depends what company you're working in, right? I used to work at a fairly large company Um there wasn't much oversight over that. And I think sometimes companies do this thing where they have like, I don't know, you're, you're a doctor, you kind of become a doctor. And is there a promote, is there a level above that? Like, yeah, there's like very, very specific yeah. tick boxy things to go up the ladder. Exactly. And that was kind of what it was like in my old firm. And you've got to kind of realize that not everyone is watching your behavior every minute. So although you may think that you're doing really, really well, unless you actually put that image out there and say, okay, this is what I've been doing. I deserve a promotion. People are often not going to see it because there's this weird thing where people only tend to notice behavior when it's not good behavior, when mm. it's negative yep. or when you like mess up and all the good stuff kind of flies under the radar. So bring that to their attention. Um, and it's, like I said, it's not rude. It's just your job. You're doing your job well. Yeah. And it kind of links to my, ne to my next tip that I'm going to give you, but um, if you're doing your job really well, if you're going above and beyond, you deserve to be paid more. Uh, I just think that's that's the case in most situations. Yeah, we were talking about this uh, earlier. Uh, so, you, so you said yeah. act, act your wage. What do, yeah, you, what do you mean my, by that? <clears throat> this is my next big habit. This act is a hot take because I think I disagree with this, but I'd love to hear what, what, what love, your view is. I'm so excited to talk yeah. about it because I do think it's a little bit um, controversial sometimes when I say this, but act your wage is basically, it's kind of like act your age. And I don't know where I saw it, but act your wage is like, if you're getting paid a certain amount, you shouldn't be too flexible with the duties that you're doing above that because you're not getting paid for those. And especially when you, when I talk about things like overtime and a lot of in Australia, at least, I think a lot of places you don't get paid for overtime. Um, that's your time. That's your life. You should value that time as much as your employer values your time. So it's about realizing what am I actually getting paid for here and how much am I willing to go over that and give more to this company? Because like at the end of the day, it's just a job. It's not your life. But what do you think? Because I know mm. you have a different, and I know there is different opinions here. Yeah, I agree that 
I think I think it depends on what you want. So mm. I think I, I I fully agree with the sentiment that your time is fundamentally the most the well the most valuable resource that you have, and you shouldn't give that time away lightly. And similarly, I agree that basically every job is quote just a job at the end of the day and mm. shouldn't come at the expense of your life. But I think I would say it's less act your wage and more act uh, act the wage you actually want. Interesting. Um, and I think that especially applies because I have a team of 15 people and it's very startup mode mm. where if someone is acting way above their wage, then I will notice that. Yeah. Uh, if someone's doing their job, I won't really notice that until they kind of, unless they like tell me and show me what they're doing. And I, I agree, like even, even with a small mm. team, everyone is just busy with everything. And so no one really has the time to have fundamental oversight on whatever, on what everyone else is doing. And so you know, one thing that some of our team members do is at the end of every week, they'll just create a little loom video recording of like, here's the stuff I worked on this week. Here are the interesting salient oh, like insights. That. And it's so easy for me to watch that at three times speed and think, fuck, that person's doing an amazing job. Yeah. Whereas the people that don't do that, it's very like they, they do fantastic work, but it's very easy for that work to fly under the radar because it's just not that visible to me because like I'm just not poking around on Notion pages and trying to see what everyone else is up to and all this, all this mm. kind of stuff. So there's there's easy ways of like, showing the boss or the manager or something what you're doing because and just that just brings it top of mind mm. but i think also in startup land and i've i've got a bunch of friends who are like sort of uh, have their own sort of companies with like five to 25 ish employees and it's really obvious who the star players are and the star players are the ones that you really fight hard to keep keep hold of to, to, to keep hold of. Yeah. And if they wanted to leave and start their own things, those star players are the ones that you would be giving the most glowing recommendations and like genuinely throwing all the clients their way if they want to become freelancers, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And that doesn't come from acting your wage. It comes from acting way above your wage and delivering at higher than the rate to that the employer is paying you. Yeah. And so there's kind of this balancing act of if you value getting a quote, getting ahead in that career and the environment is set up to recognize that then mm. acting above your wage is actually a good strategy but if you're in a corporate yeah. environment like in medicine acting above your wage doesn't do anything it's actually actively unhelpful yeah because you just physically cannot progress because you have to take certain exams and you have to be at a certain stage to take the certain exam so actually acting above your wage in, in medicine and above above your station is just likely to get you sued uh, oh. because <laughs> you know Shit. it's your senior that needs to take responsibility <laughs> for the specific thing rather mm. than you as the junior but i think in a lot of smaller smaller companies that's less the case what yeah, that's actually so interesting because you said something there that I want to grab and that is if the environment is right. I don't think that the environment is 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 right in most cases mm. and I don't think that it will be recognized unless you explicitly point it out. And so if you're willing to point it out, if you are willing to make those videos as you were talking about and call attention to that you're doing more, I think that's really valuable. But I also think that you can still do your job incredibly well and you can be incredibly productive and innovative and creative within the hours that you're getting paid yeah. for. And anything more than that, you kind of have to be happy with the fact that, you, like we said, I think we said this way before, is it worth it? Is the time you're giving up worth it for the payoff? And yeah. um, it's interesting when you talk about the, the, startup, um, the startup space and the entrepreneurial space. It's like, oh, those people are going to be the ones that are going to get the glowing recommendations. And that's really great. That can make or break a career, right? But are they going to be getting paid more to do that? And I also think that that space is very, um, very one of a kind um, compared to a lot of other, a lot of other um, industries and a lot of other mm. business models and a lot of other, um, yeah, industries and sectors. So in general, I would say that acting your wage is going to make you happier and allow you to actually uh, have work-life balance yep. better than acting above your wage. But I do really like what you were saying around um, it for your career, it can kind of make or break. And if you are acting for act the wage that you want, um, if the conditions that you're working in allow yeah. for that to be recognized, it's very interesting, right? Absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, there's a, a, a couple of points on that. One is that um, one of the piece of advice, pieces of advice I've often heard uh, from entrepreneurs is that if you want to become an entrepreneur, do not join a corporate. 
join mm-hmm. a small small business instead. Small, join a small business that has fewer than 10 employees because that will train you in business in a way that joining a big corporate will never do. The consultants will yeah. say, of course, you'll learn about how to run a business when you join McKinsey, but like bullshit. <laughs> you learn how to do PowerPoint slides and Excel models on BS that is not even relevant 50 years from now. Um, no. <laughs> whereas if you, if you join a, a small company, even if it's like a local accounting firm that has like eight people in it, you have so much visibility over everything that goes on in that business. Yeah. So that when you, if you do want to start your own business someday, that is a fantastic training ground. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And it's interesting you gave the the tax, the accounting example, because starting your own business, oh my God, I worked at, I worked in consulting. I used, I made so many PowerPoint slides. I did so much stuff like that. And the thing that was like so interesting is that I quit and I have no idea what anything about tax or how to yeah. balance my money sheets or how to budget or like how to t- handle my finances when it comes to my business. And like, I think that's such a good point. Like if you, if you want to excel, start small, and that means start small within a company, uh, start small within the skills you're learning, but also start small within the kind of employer. And that kind of links to the next part that I want to talk about for a tip in your twenties, which is job hunt and job hop as much as possible. I think that this is, as long as you leave on on good terms with your previous employer, you need to be taking as many risks and looking into as many industries and as many possibilities as possible. Very rarely will the first thing we do straight out of the gate, straight out of uni, be the thing that makes us happy and be the thing that's going to fulfill us. So the only way to sometimes realize that is to find something else to do. And it can be super random. So Like I used to work, I've I've job hopped so much. I was notorious for it. I used to work in, um, on the phone for donations for like charities. Um, then I was a data analyst and I did like data work. And then I worked for a long time in, um, not a long time, but for a while in child maltreatment and domestic violence. And then I went and did mental health policy and now I'm doing a podcast. And I learned so much from all those things that have contributed so beautifully to what I love and what I'm doing now but it also allowed me to never feel like I was wasting time because I was always doing something that kept me engaged and that I could learn from Mm. what do you think about that do you think it's better to to invest in stay at one place and really climb the ranks and learn as much as you can from there or to seek new opportunities as soon as you've kind of drain that previous source or you've learned what you need to learn yeah i think i'm with you on this one if it feels kind of weird to say because i don't want my team to leave me um because they're great um but it is broadly in an individual's better interests to job hop Mm. than it is to stay in one place yeah unless that one place is an absolute rocket ship and you know that there's like way more responsibility coming coming into the business and therefore like you actually do change your own role quite a lot Mm. i think actually uh, yeah i think it's less about changing jobs and more about changing roles yeah that's a really good point and often changing roles will mean changing jobs if it's a very rigid thing yeah but within a startup changing roles it's like if, a, if the startup is growing there's always more demand for jobs jobs to be done than there are yeah. people to do them whereas if the company is declining then there are always more people than there are jobs and so that's a real a real problem, real problem. um but i think yeah like the first six six months or 12 months probably at a job are the fastest learning curve and then beyond that you really plateau out yeah. unless you switch role at that point and so if I were <laughs> giving advice in the best interest of the team members that I don't want to leave me, I would say you should probably start looking for another job because A, yeah. the best way to get a raise is by just finding another job. Oh yeah, leverage that, leverage that. Sure. Um, but also the best way to learn more skills is finding another job <laughs> Yeah, where you get paid to learn rather than earn kind of vibe. Just do. And I love that uh, part as well. Um, my housemate, God bless him, Tom, he, I hope, <laughs> I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this. I'm sure he wouldn't mind. He does this a lot, Uh, not a lot, but he really taught me this power of leveraging other job opportunities to get promotions. And he is really good at it because he'll, he's very self-aware of like, all right, I've learned what I needed to learn at this level. I need more responsibility. And he's a, he's such a go-getter and he's so motivated. Um, And sometimes the company he works at doesn't really allow him to grow. They're a very rigid company. So he'll go out and he's so talented and so good at his job that he'll be like, okay, I've got this offer from Qantas or I've got this offer from some big company He'll and he'll leverage it and get a higher position. And so I think it's the same thing about what you said before. It's not about job hopping because that's going to be really stressful and around your finances and yeah. 
all those things, but roll hopping as well. Just take as many risks as possible. Just learn so much. Um, and also I feel like the worst, the worst feeling to have is to hit like 35 and be like, Oh fuck. Like I'm still doing the same thing I was doing at 22 and now I want to change, but I feel like I've aged out of the time that I had to, to switch, to switch around. And of course there's, you can start at any age, you can change at any age, but in our twenties, I think it's a lot easier yeah. to do that. Yeah, no, agreed. But I think equally, like, uh, there's uh, w- one of our team members, uh, Alison, has like a com- the, the complete opposite take on this. Um, so oh, really? she spent three years working her way up uh, an accounting firm and got the tax qualifications and all that stuff mm. in Ireland, and then decided to move to London for this job to work on our team. And her whole thing is, you know, for the first time in my life, I am not going to strive and I'm not going to grind. I am in my 20s. I'm going to enjoy my 20s. I'm going to, you know, I'm doing this job because it's, it's fun and interesting and it's just a job. But I'm not trying to side hustle mm. on the weekends. I'm not trying to side hustle in the evenings. I want to see every musical that London has to offer. I want to hang out with my friends every day. I want to play rugby. Like, I want to live my best life. And I, in this phase of life, I don't want to strive. I love Alison. And Alison says, says that she's the happiest person she knows. So, like, just, yeah. yeah, I think for some people, that making the intentional and active decision to actually just be happy in a job that you, that you enjoy enough to get on yeah. with and then, quote, enjoy the rest of your life outside of that is also a, a, a reasonable strategy that, and I think as long as you're not going to regret it when you're older, then mm. you you do you. My yeah. best friend, Erin, um, she has the same philosophy, which she's like, I'm actually, she's, she's very similar to Alison. She's like, my career is actually not my life. I do not live to work. Yeah. I just work to live. And the things that, and, and all that work does is give me a paycheck so I can go and do my hobbies. Mm. She's also one of, like, she's also one of the most well-balanced people that I know. And, like, she really doesn't dream of labor. And I love her for that. And she, her and her partner um, go, like, Tasmania is this island off of Australia. It's, like, beautiful. And um, it's, like, half of it is, like, basically nature, like, is a national park. Um and they like go out and they do hikes and they go and volunteer and plant native bulbs and they save wildlife. And I'm like, you guys have the best life. And it all comes from that philosophy of act your wage, be balanced, but also don't be afraid to take some risks if it's going to lead to greater balance and happiness and what you want to do. Okay, so we kind of touched on the idea of work-life balance, but I wonder if you've got any specific habits that um, you'd recommend for people in their 20s to navigate the idea of work-life balance or work-life integration or however you want to think about it. Yeah, I've got this really amazing activity kind of that I do, well, I did when I worked at 9 to 5, that I think is really valuable. So when we think about our life, I like to think about it in terms of five buckets and each day you need to do something f- in each of those categories. So one of them is physical. So exercise, moving your body. One of them is mental, looking after your mental well-being and taking care of yourself there. One of the one part of that is practical as well. So practical meaning there's just some shit you need to get done. You got to do your laundry, you got to do your groceries, you got to do those things. Social Um, so you need to feel fulfilled socially and and to get that connection. And then the final one is, uh, spiritual or emotional or, um, to do with your hobbies. So in your day, I want you, if you want, if you're really, you know, wanting to achieve work-life balance, try and find a way to hit every, every one of these five categories. So physical walk to work, um, mental check in with yourself at the end of the day, maybe take your medication that you've been prescribed do a very short five minute meditation when you get home from work. Um, in terms of practical, make yourself dinner. Just do something practical that's going to make your life better the next day. Mm. Make your bed, do some laundry, something that's going to just make your life a little bit easy. Social, call a friend. They don't have to be these big, massive time commitments. And then like a, a spiritual, mental one, maybe you're religious, you want to pray for a little while or um, read your Bible or whatever i'm not a big i'm not a very religious person whatever you want to do if you want to practice your religion or do something that like feeds your soul so one thing i do is like i knit so when i watch tv i'm like oh this feels like such like such like it's squeezing my brain of like the good energies and like it just feels like such a zombie like activity so i've taken to like knitting while i do it and it kind of it hits all those five buckets and it allows you to achieve greater work-life balance because in those hours that we 
have beyond work. We we fill it in with the things that are going to keep us feeling healthy and keep us feeling like our life is more than just our jobs. Mm. Does that make sense? Does is, does that resonate with you? Yeah, it really does. I like this. Like, I, I love categorizing things into smaller numbers than is. is yeah, right. Yeah, because it's like if, if you think if, if people are like, oh, what did what, what do I do with my life? It, like life is such a big thing. But it just becomes so so much more manageable if you split it into three or five or seven or nine. Yeah. Uh, I do need, you know, fewer is, is better uh, categories. Yeah. And on one hand as well. Yeah. Yeah. The way I think of it is uh, basically uh, work health relationships. But mm. then within health, there's uh, body, mind, soul. Yeah. And so I like to keep it simple. So it's just each day I just need to take one action in work health or relationships. Yeah. So really my like health that. thing today was I went for a walk around Hyde Park. My relationships thing is I will call my grandma after this. Mm. Uh, work thing is drawing diagrams for my book yeah. um, and sometimes the health thing will be physical like going for a walk um, and sometimes it'll be like mental slash spiritual like practicing the guitar which I've shoehorned into health because it doesn't neatly fit into yeah, work or relationships right. <laughs> um, but I think just any way of like splitting up life into a few different categories that's more manageable really helps like genuinely navigate that thing of work-life balance because if you have balance across work health relationships or however you want to split it up then you're doing pretty all right. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is take advantage of your Sundays. Oh, okay. Use your Sundays to reset and recharge. Don't fill them up with like a million social activities. If you want work-life balance, mm. it's hard. I wish there was a four-day work week as we were talking about before, but alas, we do not have that. Yep. So I always take my Saturdays for socializing and activities and mm. having fun and then my Sundays for a recharge just to get my life in order, do the laundry, dust, I've literally never dusted. I don't know why I said <laughs> it's gonna that. It's going to be like, wow, that's impressive. Vacuum. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, and of course, do your Sunday dinners. Absolutely. <laughs> we're we're trialing a nine-day fortnight in our team these days. Oh, how's it going? Uh, it's good. Our first official Friday off was like last Friday. Mm. Um, I think about half the team actually ended up taking it off. Oh, that's good. The other half ended up like including me and <laughs> ended up ended up working. But it was quite nice because there were no meetings and it was just like a day to bash through everything, anything that needed doing. Yeah. And it was quite relaxing and chill. So we're yeah. trialing this for the next six weeks. Uh, yeah, th this was actually Alison's idea. Um, she has a friend also. working at a startup that does these, these nine day fortnights. Yeah. And it, it's more manageable than a four day week, which is quite a lot of faff. And also but, other people yeah. out on a four day week. Yeah, exactly. And so like actually when you squeeze down the amount of like, days available, but nine day fortnight. Like anything that can be done in 10 days can also be done in nine days, realistically. Yeah. And the things that can't are the thing, the lowest priority things that shouldn't be done anyway. So it forces, in theory, forces prioritization. Yeah. <laughs> so we're trialing it out and seeing and seeing how it works. And over time, we might have to become more draconian about people actually taking that Friday off mm. because it's just like a, a deep work day then rather than a day off, which is, which is fine. But yeah. Yeah. At my old company, we had this thing called recharge days. Yeah. So if you'd worked, um, Two, two, two weeks or more where you'd worked in an excess of 10 hours over time, mm. you had to take a recharge day. Oh. So you had to take like a Friday or a Monday off. And that was so lovely. And I think that was really what like encouraged me to go into doing my own thing. Because mm. I was like, I love this flexibility of having a, an extra day to myself. One thing I find really helpful for work-life balance is um, something uh, called the ideal week method. So basically what this is, is that you go on Google Calendar or whatever, you create a brand new calendar, so it's completely blank, and you call it your ideal week calendar. And you just block out in the week long view, what does your ideal week actually look like or your ideal practical week? Mm -hmm. So let's say you want to wake up at seven o'clock, you would block up, wake up at seven, like do morning routine. Let's say you're at work from nine till five, you block that out for work. And maybe you can subdivide that as like, ideally, depending on how much control over you have over your schedule, this is when I'd like to do deep work. This is when I'd like to check Slack and email. This is when I'd like to have meetings ideally obviously people have different levels of control over their own schedules and then the evenings again you block out like okay every tuesday let's say in my ideal week every tuesday is a uh, i cook dinner for friends and every sunday dinner is also a dinner with friends let's say thursday night is date night wednesday night is rock climbing monday night is my alonement time mm. friday i'll just leave blank for any spontaneous thing that comes up and saturdays i'll leave empty for again spontaneous things that come up and I want to go gym three times a week. So let's say that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Mm. Uh, you know, I've, I've really been wanting to learn the guitar. And I'm like, okay, cool. I can squeeze that in on a Thursday. Oh, I really want to have singing lessons as well. But then you realize, actually, I actually physically don't have enough hours in my week anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? What's more important, singing or guitar? Actually, yeah, let's stick to guitar. I can always put singing in later. Yeah. And you then map this to your actual calendar and just try and follow this. And this is great because firstly, it gives you visibility over 
Like, firstly, it gives you intentionality over what you actually want to spend your time on. Yeah. But secondly, it gives you visibility over how much time you actually have. Yeah. Um, and it's mm -hmm. very easy, I think, especially in our 20s. And I'm, I imagine increasingly when people have kids and overcommit, like everyone feels overcommitted, like they're doing too many things. But what I find is whenever I need to add, I, whenever I want to add a new habit or a new recurring thing to my life, like I was thinking just this morning, oh, you know, I've been watching some John Mayer videos. I'd love to get back into guitar lessons. Oh. I look at the ideal week and I'm like, well, where, where do I want to fit those in? Nowhere. It's not a priority right now. Cool. It'll, it'll just go in the bucket list for at some point further down the line. Yeah. So it's just a nice way of like limiting commitments that are physically limited by the calendar. The ideal week. I really like that. All right. Final thing to talk about in terms of navigating our 20s is this idea of confidence slash finding our true self. Mm. Um, so what advice would you give to someone who's in their 20s who is maybe struggling with their identity or feels like they don't really know their, quote, true self, whatever that means? The advice I would give is that the idea of the true self is a huge myth and it is going to change a million times. It's going to change at every turn, everything that happens to you is going to change your, your concept of self. Um, but what is th the main core of that, if your true self doesn't exist, what does exist is your identity and your values. And I think that the important thing to do in your 20s is to really get a, get kind of a grasp on, on what those are. The other advice I would say is that it is so normal to not really know who you are um, in this decade. So the way that I, I like to explain it is that your identity up until the time when you're like in your late teens has literally just been um, a mashup of everything in your surroundings. It's been what your parents have told you to believe. It's been what people have said to you on the playground. It's been what your teachers have said. It's been the media that you've been consuming. The biggest ones are obviously parental and family influences. And then suddenly you fly the nest and you have to understand and, and decide what parts of that identity do I actually not believe in and not agree with. I'm going to chuck those aside. What parts of them, of that identity do I really believe in and I want to really cultivate that and engage with that and then what are the new things that are going to come in that perhaps my parents don't accept and I think a lot about this in terms of sexual identity and people discovering that after leaving conservative homes or um, your political affiliation or just your passions and and what really drives you all those things need to come together that is going to take time you're basically relearning who you are in this new context and that idea of the true self is is such a, an ambiguous, fleeting feeling. I feel like very rarely do we ever feel like our true selves because I, I don't actually think that there is one version of that that exists. Hmm. Nice. I agree. Uh, you mentioned one thing that might not change so much is your values. Yeah. What do you mean by that? So your values are essentially, um, I would call them like the core pillars of, of your identity and your and yourself. So we all know what, what values are. They're the things that we prioritize and the things that are important to us. And I think that we don't think about them enough in any, any stage of life. Okay. So there's this activity that I think is really valuable for people to do in their twenties. And it's called Oh, it has a few names, but basically it's like a, a value dictionary or um, kind of like a value tapestry where you really sit down. It literally only takes 20 minutes and just have a real deep think about what your values are. And what I want you to do is go to Google or go online and Google like the 200 top values in the world. What are the 200 most common values? And print them out, have them on your computer, choose 20 that really resonate with you. And from that 20, find get, get rid of 10. What are the top 10? And from that 10, pick out your top five. And those five values can be things like independence. They can be things like family or honesty, creativity, intel intelligence, curiosity, anything that you want really. But when we take this approach to really look at these values and think of them in the context of how we want to be, but also how we are. It's a, it's, it makes things a lot clearer about what we want from our future and how we want to act and who we want to mm. be. So I, I really recommend that to a lot of people who are in this decade as I am, I did this exercise recently and it was really powerful and seeing 
and, and being like, am I actually living my life the way that my values would tell me to? And if that's not the case, is it the fact that I'm lying to myself about what my values actually are or am I just not aligning and living with them? Mm, nice. Yeah, I've tried similar similar exercises um, quite often. I always like, it, it, it's like, because when, when you get these list of like 200 values, like basically all of them seem reasonable. Because yeah, no, right? Because no one's going to have the value of like murder or like <laughs> destruction. Like that tends not to be on this list. It tends to be no. honesty, integrity, like friendship, community, togetherness, autonomy, independence, freedom, and all, all these like things. Compassion, kind of like where mm. you're like, damn, I've got to pick just 10. But I find that really narrowing it down is, is really just about fully being honest with yourself. Mm. And it's less about, you know, I aspire to value compassion kind of thing and more about um to be honest i probably value independence more than i value compassion and just like yeah. those difficult choices where you're honest with yourself exactly. for me the ones that always come to the top of the list are the freedom autonomy independence related ones mm. and and so that you know doing those exercises I, I discovered these during lockdown initially that really helped me decide what to do with my career because mm. i was like well when, how, however I cut it, whichever find your values exercise I've done on the internet, it's always landed on independence, autonomy, freedom being like the absolute number one. So cool. Yeah. <laughs> Medicine is probably not not necessarily the career for me because it's <laughs> a little bit misaligned with that, with that specific value. Um, and things like togetherness or community is often fairly high up on the list. Mm. And I feel like, yeah, you know, when I was at university, I'd love having people around. I love having an open door policy. People are welcome whenever. It's like, I, I like that. creating that sense of community and togetherness. Whereas for other friends of mine, their value might be, you know, not related to that or where they value their own private space, which I don't really. So th <laughs> things like that, you kind of just realize by doing these exercises that what is actually important and forcing yourself to narrow it down to just three or five, mm. then it becomes a lens through which, you know, is one way to make decisions. Yeah. I love, I love that uh, independence showed up for you. Mm. That's one of mine as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Um, any other strategies or tools that you'd recommend for people to get a, a sense of who they who, who they truly are or what they what they really value? The one that I think deserves a mention here um, when it tum when it comes to living authentically and being your most authentic self is to get comfortable with disappointing people Ooh. and get comfortable with the idea that not everyone is going to like you. That links a lot to what we were talking about in terms of career, but I I honestly think that that advice, that habit, that that tip is applies to every single area that we've talked about today. You kind of have to realize that at the end of the day, this is really your life. Like you don't owe anything to anyone. If you're like a parent, you obviously owe being like, you know, there, there, there are some exceptions, but in terms of the way that you live your life and who you choose to be, um, not everyone is going to accept that and you have to be okay with that because you have to realize that your time is not their time. Mm. And regardless of whether everyone likes you or not, your life, like I said, life is going to go on. Do you want to be happy or do you want to be miserable? Because those people are not going to be happy. They've already made their choice. Um, you can make a different one and decide to be an authentic individual. And also authenticity is so attractive and it just it just makes people so attracted to you and you will find more like-minded, beautiful people who will build you up rather than try and tear you down. Hmm. Nice. I love it. Tim, I think that's a great place to, uh, to, to round this off. Uh, any final pieces of wisdom for anyone who's navigating this quarter-life struggle in their 20s? Um, I think my final piece of wisdom is just head down, you'll get through it. Um, it's super common. And I think part of the experience can be isolating, but the fact that you and I are talking about it today shows how common it actually is. So you're not alone in, in that experience. Brilliant. Thank you so much. No worries. All right. So that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.